second. Pen. Okay. Are you good to go? All right. Hello, good afternoon. <laughs> Hello, good afternoon from sunny Baltimore. Thank you, Sarah, Kyle, and Colleen for um, for welcoming uh, Roberto in our sessions of lecture sessions at SAP. So good afternoon, and it's with great pleasure that I am introducing you to Roberto, Dr. Roberto Rocco. Dr. Rocco, Rocco is trained architect and spatial planner with a master in planning by the University of São Paulo, Brazil, a specialization in urban management tools by the Ecole d'Urbanisme de Paris, and uh, the PhD by TU Delft in the Netherlands. He's an associate professor of spatial planning and strategy at the Department of Urbanism and Strategy at the Department of Urbanism at Baukunde Architecture at TU Delft. Do Dr. Rocco is a specialist in governance for the built environment that includes issues of spatial justice and social sustainability. Currently, and most importantly for the SAP Morgan students, Dr. Rocco is the initiator of a manifesto for the just city, a sequence of workshops, lectures, resources, a platform of knowledge based sharing leading to a competition that our students, together with so many other institutions around the globe, have been involved for two years now. Roberto, thank you very much for being with us and, and sharing your expertise and we're looking forward to your talk. Thank you so much, Christina, and thank you so much, uh, friends and colleagues from Morgan State. It's really an honor to be here. And I'm so happy that many, many students from Morgan State are participating in the Manifesto for the Just City, which is just amazing. Like, uh, you are very, very welcome. Um, all right, so um, I have 40 minutes to, to uh, convey a message to you. And I know that uh, the, um, you know, the communication material said that I was going to give a lecture on climate change, but that's partly true. I'm going to talk about um, social sustainability and justice uh, and how we can see climate change from that perspective. So um, I'm not going to talk about, cli about climate change. I'm going to talk about how we deal uh, uh, with, clim uh, with climate change from uh, the point of view of planning. So without further ado, let me see if I can share my screen. Yes. Uh, yes. All right. Um, I, can, I can still see a few faces, but um, I can't see the chat. So if you want to ask any questions, please let me know. <clears throat> um, I'm very happy when you guys um, ask questions and 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 interrupt me to 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 ask things because it helps me frame uh, the, the the lecture. I think you can see the the full the full screen, right? You can't see my notes, can you? No, we see <clears throat> your screen. Yeah. Okay, cool. Very good. Uh, okay, so I'm going to, um, to talk about the spatial justice of urban sustainability, and in doing so, I'm going to, to talk about spatial justice and uh, about climate change. Uh, I am based in the city of The Hague, but I, 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 I work in this uh, beautiful building in the city of Delft, that's just around the corner here, uh, where we have our uh, uh, School of Architecture and the Built Environment. Um, we have, uh, well, I'm not going to introduce the school. You can look it up online. So basically, I'm going to talk about two things, spatial justice and urban sustainability. And I'm going to try to explain to you uh, how does justice underscore sustainability? How can we look at climate change from um, a, a justice perspective? Why is justice uh, crucial for the governance of the city? And uh, I'm going to talk a, a little bit about the commons, but I'm not going to talk too much about the commons in this lecture. Um, what are alternatives for uh, the tragedy of the commons? I'm going to explain what it is. Um, and uh, maybe we can also talk a little bit about uh, the roles of planners and designers and architects in this uh, new world, this brave new world that we have. Uh, 
in front of us, right? Uh, we have a lot of new challenges that didn't exist a few decades ago, or uh, they existed, but people were not paying attention to them. And now we need to rethink, I think, a little bit our profession and how we think uh, about, you know, design and planning and how we uh, face all these uh, new challenges. In order to, um, uh, to design my lecture, I uh, lied heavily on this guy, uh, Scott Campbell, who uh, wrote a very important uh, paper on sustainable development and social justice. And in this paper, he's basically saying that there are two urgencies, um, justice and the environment, and these things they need to meet in the middle. So they are not, they are not um, opposed to each other, but they need to, to kind of, uh, uh, we, we need to find the intersection between them. And basically, as I said, I'm going to talk about sustainability and justice. All righty, um, a few uh, months ago, um, the European Union, the European Commission um, published uh, what they call the European Green Deal. And the European Green Deal in reality was inspired by the American Green Deal, which has not been approved, right? It has not passed. Um, and this, uh, this uh, green deal in Europe means that they want to face all the challenges that you can see on the screen, climate ambition, clean energy, circular economy, and so on, to make our uh, continent uh, carbon neutral by 2050, right? It's a lot of uh, good legislation and it's, um, it rests on two pillars, uh, financing this transition to sustainability. So, you know, Put, put the money where your mouth is and uh, you have to really invest in this. And for that, they have uh, 1 trillion uh, euros being invested. So it's a little bit similar. Let me walk back a little bit what I just said because the Green Deal was not, it has not passed, but um, in the bill that uh, Joe Biden has just approved and in the other bills that are uh, hopefully going to be approved soon, there are many, many, many elements that are similar to this one. So I, as a foreigner, so I'm not American, right? I don't have a, <laughs> I am, a, uh, I don't have a party in the United States, but I think that bill is really great. All right, let's go back to the European one. So they want to finance the transition and for that they're putting more than 1 trillion euros but they also think that the transition needs to be a just transition, leaving no one behind. So this is the second, the second uh, pillar. And of course, uh, everybody knows uh, the history of humanity is a long transition. We are always transitioning from something to, to something else, right? Uh, we were hunter-gatherers and now uh, we live in cities. So that was maybe the, the the greatest transition in our history, but there are many, many other transitions. Just for you to, uh, just as an example, uh, the uh, industrial revolution was a huge transition for us and it did produce winners and losers. A lot of, uh, of people lost their, their jobs in, in, in agriculture and they were um, crammed in slums in the uh, in the uh, in London, right? I'm getting a little bit distracted by. Oh, I think. All right. Um, all right. So um, you know, every transition uh, has winners and losers, and with the with this, we have actually a social upheaval. Um, you know, lack of social cohesion human suffering and, and, and political upheaval. So these things um, could be avoided um, in, in the present transition, right? Um, you know, this was London um, in the 19th century at the, you know, at the peak of the, of, the, of the Industrial Revolution. These are the UK miner strikes in the 80s when mining all but ceased in the in the UK. So, you know, 
we have winners and losers at the beginning, and now we have winners and lots of losers at the end of the Industrial Revolution, so to speak, in the UK. So how can we prevent that from happening? How can we prevent injustice from happening, human suffering, uh, political upheaval, and so on? Well, uh, maybe you have seen me talk about this. I always use the same uh, example, the three kids with the flute, all right? They are, uh, there are three kids walking down the street and they see a flute uh, lying on the ground. And we have to decide to whom are we going to give the flute? And uh, of course, Ibrahim says, uh, I am the only one who knows how to play the flute. I can make the best of it. Um, so maybe we should give him the flute. But Mary says, well, I'm the poorest of us and I don't have any toys. The flute will make me happier. But Laura says, I have worked very hard to buy this flute. Just when I want to enjoy it, you want to take it away from me. So when I present this example, which is actually an example from um, uh, uh, Amartya Sen from his book, uh, the idea of justice. And with these examples, I'm trying to convey three view views of what could be fair, right? And here, when I say that Laura owns the, the, the flute, my students, they generally go, oh, okay, well, it's settled. Uh, it's Laura's, right? Uh, she owns it. So that's it. In reality, that's not how things work in, in public life and in public policy. There are many, many instances in which we uh, have a utilitarian approach in which we are thinking about, you know, the welfare of the majority um, rather than property. There are instances in which we are talking about redistribution and egalitarianism. So that's a more of a socialist approach in which people should have access to the same um, resources or similar resources. And uh, here we are talking about libertarianism, which is uh, a lot of the debate in the United States right now is around the idea of freedom, entrepreneurship, and the ability to you know, to be uh, an, an entrepreneur and, and to own stuff, right? So this, what is important, even it, it doesn't matter uh, where you live, um, these three uh, conceptions of justice, they exist in the world and they are commonly applied by, by politicians all the time to decide on issues of distribution of resources, right? Uh, in many, many instances, Property is not the overriding consideration. Sometimes property um, uh, means that, well, it will mean that I will have to uh, uh, compensate you for your property in order to uh, distribute um, the resources more fairly. All right, so we know that these three um, uh, conceptions of justice uh, exist in, in, in reality. Well, some of our countries, they are more, um, inclined to one or another. I would say that um, the Netherlands where I am is between utilitarian and economic egalitarianism. So there's a lot of redistribution here. But what's my point by presenting this example? And maybe you're thinking, okay, I would give the, the flute to Laura because it belongs to her. No, I want to give the, the flute to Mary because she doesn't have any other toys and she will be happiest with the, with the flute. Or you're thinking, no, maybe I should give the flute to Ibrahim because he can play the flute and by playing the flute, he will make everybody happy, right? Uh, yeah, we have to decide. And this is exactly my point. Uh, we, we can only decide by a public uh, reasoning. Um, so we need to put this problem in the public and the public needs to discuss and arrive at some kind of, uh, of decision. Um, in practice, that, that's not exactly how it works. Uh, our politicians, they take a lot of decisions for us, even uh, behind our backs or without telling us. Uh, or some, sometimes we're not informed about the decisions, but um, it's important that we understand that uh, 
first of all, these three um, uh, conceptions of, of justice exist. They're commonly applied in policy making and it depending a little bit on the culture and, uh, and the political inclination also of, of, the, of the people, right? Um, okay, having understood um, that uh, justice is a matter of public um, debate, we can debate on different, uh, on different conceptions of justice, Let's have a look at what sustainable development is and how we can uh, connect uh, these ideas, right? This is the classical definition. Sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. We all know that. Uh, it's very uh, uh, known from uh, the report, Our Common Future from 1987, also known as the Brundtland Report named after, after Gro Harlem Brundtland, the former prime minister of Norway. Uh, there is a little link to a, a movie here. You can watch it later. I will send you my presentation. She's amazing. And she led the, this report written in, in 1987 about sustainability, about sustainable development. And okay, if we look at this uh, definition, we can see that there are two words that are important. One are the needs of the present. So we have very concrete needs. We need to eat, we need to live in a house, in a shelter, we need to heat our houses, we need to go from A to B. So we have very concrete needs and these needs need resources, right? Um, but we also need to, uh, to think about the future generations and the generations that come after us and what do they need, what are their needs. So the needs are basic human rights that uh, we all have and uh, future generations are not here now. So my conclusion is that future generations uh, need advocates and maybe you can be the advocate for future generations. In the same report, they, they say, well, you know, if you look, look at our definition of sustainability, you will understand that even a narrow notion of physical sustainability. So even if we are talking only about uh, the environment, implies a concern for social equity between this generation and the next. So we want to have our needs fulfilled in this generation. We want the next generations to have their, their needs fulfilled. So there is some social equity between generations. And this concern must logically be extended to equity within each generation. So what, what are they saying here? They're saying, oh, wow, it doesn't, makes sense to think about uh, future generations and their welfare if we are not thinking about the welfare of everybody here and now living today, right? So uh, there is an intergenerational justice aspect and there is an intragenerational uh, justice aspect. Intergenerational within this uh, generation, intergenerational, sorry between this generation and, and the next and intragenerational within this generation. Well, you can say, well, sustainability, what is sustainability? I hear many of my colleagues say, oh, this is such an empty word. You know, it doesn't mean anything. Um, it's such a tired word. Everybody uses it um, all the time. What do they mean? Well, sustainability is multidimensional. People define it using the most amazing uh, dimensions or aspects of it. But I try to, to keep simple, to keep it simple and use three. We have environmental sustainability, we have economic sustainability and social sustainability. Uh, and we know now, oh, we didn't know that very much before we were too concerned with uh, ecological sustainability, we, rightfully, right? We need to preserve our planet. That's very important. But we know now that uh, they, these three dimensions, they need to exist uh, simultaneously for sustainability to exist. So economic sustainability, social sustainability, and environmental sustainability must exist at the same time, simultaneously. Otherwise, you don't have real sustainability. Um, 
it is actually the political and economic structures that support environmental sustainability and life in our planet. Oh, what do you mean, Roberto? This is so complicated. Well, in order for us to preserve our planet and to, to, to live together, we need political structures. We need uh, democracies. Sometimes, well, in China, they have a more of a totalitarian state, right? Uh, that is very capitalist, by the way. It's in the, um, but we need political structures that allow us to live together and to kind of manage our life together. Uh, this brings me to the notion of social sustainability, because uh, in this notion, what we are trying to understand is how these political structures and social structures um, broadly understood. Um, so, oh, something went wrong. Okay, uh, social structures uh, broadly understood how they, how they uh, support, how they uh, underscore sustainability. Um, and I'm going to tell you that justice underscores sustainability not only because it's a moral thing to do. So there is the moral imperative, leave no one behind, that's in the, in the uh, sustainable development goals, the SDGs, right? But also in the Green Deal, uh, European Green Deal, we shouldn't leave no one behind. That's the right thing to do. No one should suffer or, you know, uh, be left behind. But justice is also important for acceptability of policy, for support for policy, compliance with policy, suitability of the policy to the problem and coordination. Coordination is a huge um, challenge for us because how can we go from a um, carbon-based economy to a decarbonized economy uh, if, every, if everybody does whatever they want, right? We, um, but, uh, okay, what does that mean? Should people then be constrained to do certain things? What about personal freedom? What about democracy? Um, how can we coordinate this transition in a way that still preserves um, the personal freedom of everyone? Um, here, I want to make a parenthesis because I think uh, the, the virus, the pandemic has taught us a lesson. Um, coordination is super important, but um, uh, what we have seen is that um, it's not easy to do and people are not willing to comply because they don't accept the, the, the policies as just. They don't accept uh, that they have to wear masks uh, you know, when they board an airplane because they, they think this um, infringes on their personal freedom and so on. So how can we bring these two things together? How can we manage this? Uh, all right. This, the transition is urgent. We know that, uh, you know, our, uh, like um, uh, Greta Thunberg says, our house is on fire. Uh, the transition is urgent, but is it going to be fair? Is it just? So uh, with my students, I always, uh, I always think of examples of transitions in the past. I invite you to do the same. There are several transitions uh, we are going through in the United States. Um, carbon um, uh, charcoal extraction. Um, so mining in the, uh, in the Appalachians is a problem uh, because it's unsustainable environmentally, but the communities that live off um, uh, mining are not very happy that um, mining uh, needs to be stopped. And because they're not happy, they are angry. And because they're angry, they vote for uh, a populist, uh, populist politicians who offer them very simple but false explanations about reality, right? Um, and, uh, and that's an example of how sustainability and justice need to come together. Uh, we should be able to offer an alternative to the mining families uh, in, the, uh, in Appalachia so that they understand the problem and that they 
are able to move on to another sector of the economy in a, a fair way, right? Um, what is happening in reality is that there is a lot of political manipulation and ideological manipulation of these people so that they become uh, extremely against uh, climate change and extremely against any policy that supports uh, the transition, the fair transition and so on. So I hope I, with my examples, I'm making clear the connection between the, the political uh, structures and the need to make our planet sustainable. Um, <clears throat> um, well, this is a difficult part for me to, to, uh, to explain. Uh, I will try to do it uh, the best that I can. And I hope uh, you interrupt me if you don't understand what I'm saying. Uh, uh, not because I, uh, my English is not perfect, so please forgive me. Um, uh, we have two things uh, that we have to consider. One is truth and the other is justice. The European Union has three, three uh, kind of guidelines for policy making. So every policy here needs to be um, uh, evidence-based and science-based, It means, to, <laughs> which means that it needs to be based on some kind of truth that we found through serious research, right? It needs to be, uh, every policy needs to be participatory or, or at least uh, there must be some citizen engagement, which speaks to the justice, right, of, the, of, the, of these two things. And it needs to be integrative. So it needs to, uh, the policy needs to integrate several sectors of, of activity. That's not so much our concern right now, but our concern is really about truth and justice. Um, this, how does that speak to architectural planning students, right? Or designers in general? Why are you talking about these things, Roberto, here? Um, one thing that uh, bothers me to no end is that uh, we are taught in our architectural schools that we are little geniuses and that with our designs, we are going to save the world, right? And there is less concern for the first part of, of this, uh, of this um, uh, sentence here, that we need to do things that are evidence-based. We need to do research. We need to do really serious research to understand the problem and to address the problem in a, in a true way. And uh, another thing that um, um, uh, bothers me to know <laughs> to know and is that um, uh, justice is seen as a, something rather personal or too philosophical and therefore, yeah, it's not for us to, to talk about that. And I, I disagree. I think we need to talk about uh, both uh, justice and truth because they not only contribute to the formation of a democratic sphere here, but they are also underscoring science and they should underscore design more, more I think, um, um, as my friend Greta Thunberg uh, says, science and democracy are strongly interlinked. Um, uh, I'm, not, I'm not oblivious to the fact that I'm talking to an American audience and this is special for me because I think the United States is at the crossroads of this, uh, this conundrum. Uh, in which science and truth and, uh, and uh, uh, truth and justice are uh, being uh, distorted in the public domain, right? And by, by, by politicians. And I think we need to be really, 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 really careful about that. Okay, um, I still have 20, oh my God, I still have 20 minutes, guys. So. I hope you're not too bored, <clears throat> but please tell me, Christina, you have to, I don't know if I can't see Christina anymore, but please tell me when I have to stop. Uh, we are fine, I think, Sarah? <laughs> yep, you've got plenty of time. Good. Yeah, I, I see that, I see here, I still have 20 minutes, so uh, bear with me. No, no, it's not boring. No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. What we are, um, 
what we are experiencing right now in our world, and many of you, I'm sure, will think, oh, you know, a lot of it is because of overpopulation. If only people had less children, the world would be better, right? But that's uh, very, very misleading. I don't think overpopulation is our problem at all. Uh, actually, the United States at the moment is facing a, a, the beginning of its democra demographic crisis where the population is not being uh, replaced right, by the natural birth and immigration. So uh, in a few years, it's possible that the population of the United States starts to decrease. Um, of course, that's not going to happen uh, tomorrow and it's not happening in Africa or in some parts of Asia, but it is happening uh, in Europe. It's happening in Latin America. Um, you know, Latin America until, until last week, it was uh, the global South, but it, now they are facing a demographic uh, crisis. China is already facing a demographic crisis. So overpopulation is not really the problem. I think the big problem is overconsumption and uh, unregulated consumption and consumption by a, a little groups of people at the expense of very large groups of people who don't have access to any resources. So I go back to my notion of, um, of, uh, of uh, justice, right? So Ibrahim, he would say, well, that's not fair, right? We should think of the, you know, the majority. We have to make the majority uh, have access to things. Um, because this consumption, uh, this overconsumption happens, in this finite planet, we have only one planet. We are not going anywhere. Sorry, um, uh, Elon. Uh, you know, Elon Musk is not taking us to Mars. Uh, I can guarantee you that he's taking a, 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 like five billionaires and we are going to stay here, right? And we can't go anywhere. Uh, we need to fulfill our, our, uh, our needs, as I explained, but um, we are fulfilling these needs in very unfair ways. Some people are, are consuming too much, other people don't have enough, and we are consuming the, the, the whole planet, and that's unfair for future generations. It's also unfair for the vulnerable people in this generation. We know that not everybody has the same um, capacity to earn um, they're living or to be entrepreneurial and to be, you know, like Elon. Well, not everybody is an Elon Musk. Uh, we have to think about people who are um, vulnerable. And I'm going to say something that is shocking for some, but in half of the world, women are oppressed. They can't have business. They can't own property. Uh, they are oppressed uh, and well, don't get me started, right? Um, 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 uh, the gender imbalance globally is horrible. So how can we achieve some kind of justice when uh, a few people are consuming so much, others cannot consume as much, and we have so many vulnerable people in the world who cannot actually compete for, for the resources? That's a, a huge problem. Um, this is the tragedy of the commons. So if we think of the world as our big commons, right? Um, we know that uh, in a world where everyone is seeking their own self-interest, if left unregulated, common resources are destined to exhaustion. So this is the tragedy of it. Um, if, if we don't regulate it, um, it's going to, to, to finish, right? And uh, well, is this true? Let's have a look. Um, I'm going to, to go, I'm, I'm not going to explain this uh, doesn't, uh, because of the time. <clears throat> oh no, now I see, I have five minutes actually. 10 minutes, I, I think I have 10 minutes. I, I was looking at the wrong watch. 
uh, as I said, um, we are in this uh, ball floating in, this, in space and we are here alone so far, right? I do believe there is life in other planets, but so far they haven't contacted us. And uh, we need to make do with, these, uh, with this resource that was you know, given to us and uh, from which we can uh, live off. And we have to think about uh, this generation and we have to think about the next generations that we know. But sustainability studies start to conceptualize our planet as a big commons. It means that this is our common resource. And um, okay, you know, okay, we have private property and some people they own parts of this resource and it's uh, incredibly unfair because 1% owns um, uh, you know, 80% of the, of the earth. Uh, that's not fair, but uh, what can we do about it? Um, what can we, uh, how can we think about it? So there is no agreement, right? There is the lifeboat hypothesis, the, there is the boat hypothesis, and there is the Titanic hypothesis, which is my hypothesis that I invented, which is a bit funny. And I'm going to explain how a lot of our politicians think they believe in the lifeboat boat hypothesis. The lifeboat hypothesis in sustainability is like this. We are in, an, uh, uh, in a lifeboat and uh, we are in open sea and around us, there are 100 people trying to get on the boat. And the boat is our resource. If we let all these 100 people um, uh, get to the boat, the boat will sink and we will all die. So this is how a lot of our politicians conceive the world. This is a, called a world view, right? And uh, this is uh, related to the, to the use of resources. Let's see how this, um, this connects with the real politics. My solemn duty to protect America and its citizens the United States will withdraw from the Paris Climate Accord Thank you. Thank you. But begin negotiations to re-enter either the Paris Accord or in really entirely new transaction on terms that are fair to the United States, its businesses, its workers, its people, its taxpayers. So we're getting out, but we will start to negotiate and we will see if we can make a deal that's fair. And if we can, that's great. And if we can't, that's fine. All right. Well, um... Sorry, uh, I know you thought you were free of, um, you, you know, got rid of Trump, but now Roberto is bringing Trump to the lecture. Um, I think that's a very good example of how uh, politicians conceive the world in terms of this lifeboat. Um, um, uh, so the United States would be this lifeboat and, you know, we have to keep everybody out. Otherwise, uh, we are going to sink. And it's not fair to the American people then to have this uh, uh, you know, preoccupations about climate change and oil and, and charcoal and so on, right? What really is happening in reality is that uh, countries uh, have um, a, a carbon footprint that is historic, so that has evolved uh, in history. And I mean, come on, the United States is the most developed country in the world. It, I mean, right? It, because it used a lot of resources in the world. And uh, it's not the only one. Lots of countries have used resources. The European Union is also a culprit. China, the uh, Russian Federation, Japan, and so on. Uh, but we can think of the world as this life, uh, of our countries as lifeboats, because we are all interconnected. So the uh, boat hypothesis, which is the hypothesis that I think is right, um, um, tells us, well, there is nobody at sea trying to get in our boat. We are all on the same boat, right? 
Um, and this boat is called the Earth. And we have to now try to understand how are we going to, to um, share the resources among everybody who is in the same boat. I love this picture, but this picture has a problem. Everybody uh, on this picture is beautiful and, and, and young. And that's not how, how the world is, right? Um, however, I like, I like that there are all races here and everybody's on the same boat. That's why I use it. But uh, we are, um, how are we going to divide the resources of this boat among us? And uh, then we have all these um, different views, right? My humorous take on the boat hypothesis is that um, we are actually on the Titanic and the Titanic has first class, the second class and the third class. And people have, uh, uh, they have access to very different uh, kinds of resources. Uh, and we have to think about that. One way to think about that is the donut economy um, uh, way of thinking which is about um, trying to understand what are our uh, uh, bio limits, so the, the, the biophysical boundaries of our planet, and what are the social th thresholds that we need to, to fill. And here you can see that the Philippines um, uh, hasn't uh, reached the biophysical boundaries of the world, so they're doing quite well, but they also haven't filled the uh, social thresholds so they have problems in their social, uh, in the justice part of, of, the, of sustainability. Whereas the European Union has filled a lot of the biophysical boundaries, but it was a little bit more successful in the social threshold. So uh, this, is, uh, this is by a woman called Kate um, Raworth. Uh, she is British and uh, you can read about the, the donut economy very easily on the internet. Okay, um, I want to finish with a few examples. So I'm going to jump a little bit. So sorry if I'm, um, I think I'm uh, on time, but just, just to, so how does that translate into urban development? Uh, we have um, people using resources, but producing jobs and so on. Um, but uh, we, uh, as a society, we suffer the, um, uh, let's say, the, the negative externalities of that production. And one good example is pollution. So this, um, this industry probably, well, it's a bad photo, by the way. I don't think this is an industry. This is heating. Um, but just to illustrate what, what I want to say, um, uh, an industry produces jobs products, uh, money, it produces prosperity, but it also produces what we call negative externalities. And the negative externalities are the undesirable uh, byproducts of any human activity. And in this case, it's pollution. Uh, while the, while the, the um, sorry, uh, so while the, um, um, fruits of this prosperity are shared by some, the negative externalities produced here are shared by all of us. So this needs some kind of regulation, taxation, et cetera, to off offset the negative externalities. Another example is uh, 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 private cars. We all love our cars. Uh, they take us from A to B, et cetera, and so on. I have to tell you that in Europe, um, young people don't have cars almost anymore. Uh, the youth have given up having cars. Um, so they have great individual utility, but they produce lots of shared negative externalities. And the biggest shared externality that they produce is, um, is uh, space. So they consume a lot of space and they produce a lot of pollution uh, of the air, right? So here, uh, this classical meme. Um, so these are the number of people in the cars. If we put them in a bus or in, in bicycles, here we put them in a bus, in two buses, and here 
whatever in a light trail. So uh, this is to give an example of the negative externalities that I'm talking about. It's another example. All right. Um, I want to finish um, with um, this thought that we as planners, designers, architects, we have a role in trying to understand how these trade-offs occur. Uh, we have a role presenting, um, presenting visions to politicians because they lack visions. They are tremendously uh, dumb sometimes and they don't know what's going <laughs> uh, on, uh, on the ground. So it's our job to present them with alternatives and, um, and uh, policies and designs that are based on these two things, truth and justice for a sustainable world. I hope, um, I hope uh, you enjoyed the lecture and I would love to have some questions. My lecture, as you can see, is not finished. I, I'm not going to bother you anymore, but I'm going to send you um, I'm going to send you uh, my my presentation so you can see how it ends right later on. It's quite pretty pretty self-explanatory. Hi, Roberto. Thank you so much. Um, very insightful. Uh, it all makes sense and I don't understand how come we just don't listen to uh, to all this. I mean, uh, there are signs left and right, right? Um, I do have two questions and they are very connected to each other. So you can answer at once, I believe. And I believe it's also connected to your lecture. And I'm referring to the uh, UN conference on climate change going on right now in Scotland and also yeah. the, Belarus, the Belarus uh, invasion, let's say, of immigrants, which is also uh -huh. happening right now. And uh -huh. I would like uh, to ask you, what kind of connection is there between justice and trust? Because one of the major things that I, at least that caught my attention coming from the conference is um, the, north of, the north of the world countries are trying to lead a sustainable life with whatever sustainable definition might be, social, economical, climate, whatever mm -hmm. it may be, uh, which I uh, included always in social, uh, sustain social sustainability, which includes, I think, everything really. Uh, <laughs> but then... You know, but then we are trying to and we are pointing fingers at countries like Russia or China, which are the new economy, quote unquote, the new economies. And they are also the bigger pollution. How do we convince them not to lead, um, uh, you know, a sinful life and stop consuming the way we were 20 years ago? Right. How can we be uh -huh. so arrogant in going like you guys need to stop consuming you guys need to stop owning because you're polluting the world but we were doing the same thing just uh, a few years ago and the second is how can we stop uh people that are really needy and they're coming into uh they come into europe trying to uh better their lives but we are stopping them with barbed wires and weapons and we're telling mm -hmm. them you know you just cannot benefit from all this how can this be, be just Christina, I think I'm going to start with the Belarusian uh, thing because I, uh, if you allow me, um, I, I think maybe that's not the best example because I think the Belarusian uh, specifically um, uh, crisis is being uh, instrumentalized and used by Russia and by Belarus to destabilize the European sure. Union. Sure. Uh, but uh, uh, the, the argument is uh, we are the stopping people. the immigrants. Yeah. Uh -huh. Um, and, uh, for example, we have been doing that for a long time, not only in Belarus, right? Um, so as I try to explain, um, I think the developed nations of the world, they have, um, they have a huge responsibility because they already um, used quite a lot of the resources and they produced a lot of negative externalities, like I tried to explain. And uh, and they did. It's a historical process, right? So um, there is a huge uh, responsibility to offset what the developed nations have done, right, in the past. Um, I think there. Uh, uh, I I was a bit like not so um, completely. Uh, 
disdainful of, of COP26 COP because I saw that there was one thing that they agreed that was really quite important. Um, uh, they, they agreed to stop uh, uh, extracting um, fossil fuels in a certain amount of time. And they also agreed to stop uh, cutting forests. So those are good things, but they need to agree on a plan of um, reparation and, uh, and uh, support. Reparation, why? Because slavery um, and other uh, unfair uh, things that happened in the past have an effect in the present and they need to be, uh, yeah, they need to be repaired. They need to be offset. Uh, I, I, I mentioned slavery because I think that's the main, um, the main problem, really, the main thing that happened that needs uh, reparation. Uh, somebody needs to be paid for the suffering. Um, I really believe that. Uh, but uh, apart from that, um, so there is a huge responsibility from, from from the developed notions, uh, nations, but um, uh, the developing nations are not off the hook. They cannot claim now that because they are undeveloped that they are going to, oh, okay, we are going to do um, unsustainable practices. That's not, uh, if, if they can, and if they get the money uh, from the developed nations, um, they should, opt for sustainable technology, right? Um, I say that, um, look, because we cannot let the, the, it's not like, oh, you know, I didn't pollute in the past, so I can do whatever I want now. That's not how the, the world uh, works, right? Um, now, um, with my boat hypothesis, what I think it speaks very closely to immigration, huh? because I think if we imagine the United States as this boat, and if you think, okay, we have to stop people coming here because they are going to, to, to consume all our resources, all, or the European Union, uh, yeah, that's, that's BS, right? Because we are in one world, we are all interconnected. Um, we are all uh, suffering the effects of the pandemic. We are, and we need some form of global solidarity. Um, and this global solidarity, I don't know how it's going to happen because um, do we need a global government? Some people are really scared about that. Do we need um, less democracy? Because, you know, democracy is a dirty business. It doesn't work very well. And, uh, you know, time consuming. And, uh, you know, people argue all the time. It's easier to be like China and just say, okay, let's do this and this and that. Whoa, really? Do we need to be like China? Do we need to really infringe on people's uh, individual freedom? So, look, I don't have an answer. but. Uh, I'm happy to discuss, really. <laughs> so my, my answer actually is that I believe we need more and better democracies and we need more and better governments, not less government. Agree, thank I you. <laughs> yes, you did, you did. <laughs> Sorry for the rant. Guys, uh, the students, totally understandable. <laughs> if there are questions, I'm happy to answer. Guys, do not hesitate. Remember that there is a manifesto, so we have the biggest protagonist right here. <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> anyway, um, maybe if you guys want to do, make questions on the chat. Yeah. Anyway. Otherwise, I think uh... they're very shy. Yeah. <laughs> well, I do know I yesterday we had a little chit chat about their plans for the submission. And there was one team in particular talking and hammering on sustainability. I don't want to, to call my oh, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah, here oh. you go. <laughs> okay. Let me, uh, hello, good afternoon. 
Dr. Roberto, thank afternoon. you for the <laughs> thank you for the lecture. Yeah, uh, for the manifesto, uh, we're trying to work on the topic like you just presented about uh, sustainability and uh, the modern technology going hands in hands uh, for a better sustainable sustainable community or the cities. You know, how can mm -hmm. we incorporate those two two stuff for the betterment for us as humanity or as a, you know, for the planet as a whole. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, but do you have a question or, uh, uh, I mean, this sounds like music to me. So go, go forward. <laughs> uh, what I was saying, is there any like other resources, you know, or any ideas that we could put into the manifesto about uh, like hammering at one particular area of the sustainability with technology like you know it's pretty big it's pretty vast uh, <clears throat> uh sagar sagar do i pronounce yeah. it correctly uh i think you have to talk from your own heart and your own experience so uh, uh there must be something that makes you angry uh right about what's going on in the world and maybe that thing really affects you personally so I would suggest that really, um, really talk from the heart and talk from things that you experience uh, as injustice or as uh, what is an injustice in your city um, or in your country, um, I would say. So uh, I don't have a recipe. Uh, in one of my emails, there is a, a, like a link to a lot of, of, of texts that we shared with you guys. Uh, I suggest uh, reading some of those te texts, but uh, you know, in the end, it's about what are you angry about or what really bothers you, right? Uh, uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and any any other any other question, guys? Well, Devin is saying I think the overconsumption helped play a role into the situation with homelessness. Uh, I don't, yeah, maybe what is the, what plays a role with homelessness is lack of access to credit and lack of access to, um, so the United States um, has a lot of social programs. I have a friend working at the CDC and he says, well, if actually people knew how many social programs we have, they would be a little bit angry because they have been brainwashed to think uh, that uh, we don't need social programs, but um, depending on the city, there are programs of uh, access to social housing, right? Um, social housing is very stigmatized in the United States, but it, it needn't be so. Social housing could be a, a good thing and, and uh, could be good quality and could be accessible to a lot of people. Um, so because you cannot get a mortgage, should you live in the street? I don't think that's a good system. What kinds of strategies can be used with the issue of overconsumption by the few and privileged? Uh, Kate, <laughs> I think I'm going to, to give a very, like, I'm, <laughs> tax the rich. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, you have to tax uh, people who, who have, you know, amassed amounts of money that they will never be uh, able to to spend. In my example of the flutes, um, Mary, um, she says, well, you know, I don't have any, any toys. If I get that flute, I'll be very happy. Because Mary doesn't have a lot, if you give her a, a reasonable amount, so one flute, she'll be extremely happy. If you give a flute to someone who has 100 flutes, they will not even notice. So I think there is space. And uh, I know that uh, you cannot talk about socialism in the United States because that's kind of a ah. <laughs> But um, in reality, in Europe, for example, there are lots of programs and ways to distribute the wealth a little bit by taxing people uh, who earn too much or a lot and trying to help those who earn too little. Um, and I think that's, um, that's not communism, it's just democratic socialism, and which I think is uh, 
quite uh, quite okay. This is this is the case in the Netherlands, right where I am. Um, you wouldn't believe the quality of social housing here. It's like kind of a incredibly nice. I was uh, I was living in social housing when I was um, uh, um, a PhD student, and I had a huge apartment and. And that they do that because they think that uh, it every everything starts with having a home. You cannot uh, be a functioning citizen, contribute to a society if you are obliged to live in the streets. Uh, a, a, a homeless person is lost to themselves. They are uh, um, facing incredibly incredible suffering, which we should avoid. But they are also not very useful to society because they have to survive every day. Everything starts with a home. If you are more interested about that, there is um, a program in Finland called Home First. Uh, let me give you a, a link. Ah, excuse me, football. Oh, Housing First, they call it. I'll give you the name of the program in which they in Finland uh, have this idea that the first thing you have to provide is a house, is decent, decent housing. I'm not saying that everybody in the in, in the Netherlands or in Europe has a housing. And we have there, <laughs> there is there are homeless people here uh, as well, but uh, not as much. Yeah, I especially with you, hundred <laughs> percent. I think that the United States has such a long way to go before people can think that way. I mean as was evidenced by the struggle to pass the current bill that we passed and hopefully the next bill um, with the infrastructure. And, oh, this, uh, this new bill, yeah. this bill from, uh, you know, the last bill that was approved, it, is, it has a lot of very good things in it. It's a pity that they couldn't go as far as they wanted because of uh, opposition, even from within yeah. the, Demo the Democratic Party, but... It's yeah. something at least, it's a start. And a lot of it, if I may, uh, Kate, um, I think a lot of it comes from, um, uh, you know, this ideological debate. So you cannot talk about redistribution because it's socialism. <gasps> oh no, this is anti-American and so on. This is really BS. I mean, it's really BS. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, although yet uh, there was a protest right in um, in Rotterdam about social housing and the fact that they are uh, coming down they're basically destroying a lot of social housing uh, estate Roberto yeah that's true but I think it was more a protest about uh, 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 so what's happening in Rotterdam is that Rotterdam is becoming much much richer than it used to be and they want to attract these rich people so that they can pay more taxes and the poor people are being kind of uh, evicted to the to the suburbs and that's what they don't want uh, uh, but it's a little bit a problem of uh, too much prosperity and uh, gentrification in Amsterdam uh, you can't have any development without 30% of social housing. It's, it's, I, and in The Hague as well, where I am. So you cannot do anything without 30% of social housing, which is uh, really great. All right. Uh, I, I don't know. I think we reached the hour and we went over. It's always yeah. very interesting to talk to you, Roberto. Thank you so much, Christina, for, for inviting me. It's such a pleasure to talk to people in uh, Morgan State. And I hope to read <laughs> I hope to read your manifestos very, very soon. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much in New Whale. Definitely. Take care. Thank you so much.